So let me start again by thanking you, Angela, Steph, and the technical team, and everybody who's giving us the time to come together to do some thinking. Thinking the most uh, ne necessary, vital, aesthetic, erotic, and difficult of activities. <laughs> thinking like breathing is what we do, even when you can't breathe for a number of reasons. And trying to think together through the difficulties of the times that we're going through is what this wonderful team of people as Oferaida are trying to do. Amazing. And thinking as opposed to pontificating, critical creative thinking, thinking as a way of coping with the times, to be worthy of the times. And the posthuman convergence, another post, we don't really need any more of those, we need a better term. But the posthuman convergence, which I will try to talk a little bit around tonight, is really at the core of so many of our problems. I was very touched by how Stefan started by reminding us of the pandemic, the big pandemic that we are laboring under. Now think for a moment of COVID-19. This is a man mind, a human made virus uh, created by environmental devastation, by violent human animal interaction, taking off in the global economy with, with the intercontinental travel and transportation and all sorts of contaminations. An environmental problem uh, due to human interference that becomes a social problem insofar as this pandemic has revealed the depth and the extremes of inequalities, of social economic injustices in terms of access to sanitation, to basic necessities, to healthcare, and very soon the new global war for vaccines, which is just starting. Uh, COVID that becomes a social problem having been born as an environmental one. And what is the answer to this pandemic? How are we surviving? Look at us tonight through more technology, through digital interconnection, using the very tools of cognitive capitalism, although we know that cognitive capitalism is at the source of the very problems that we are addressing. Welcome to the posthuman convergence where advanced technologies and environmental degradation run together, where enormous disparities in health and wealth and access go together with enormous enthusiasm about the great technological advances, the great levels of development that are being reached, pulled in very opposite directions at the same time. And this is what I call the posthuman convergence, a convergence between the ideas of humanism with the human is at the core of everything, man as the me measure of all things, and then man in inverted commas of implies ethnocentric, gender specific um, uh, qualities. And um, it's supposed to be a universal feature, but it is so culture specific. Look at the image that encapsulates classical European humanism, the Vitruvian man that I talk so much about in my, in my books, gorgeous Vitruvius, um, a masculine, perfect body, drop dead gorgeous, um, completely uh, white and about his sexuality, Freud wrote quite a few interesting things in his famous article on Da Vinci's Vitruvius, go and look it up. How universal is this? It is a very, parochial, patriarchal, colonial, Eurocentric vision of what the universal is, of what the human is. And it's supposed to represent all humans, but it sure does not. And before you dismiss this Renaissance classical ideal as something passé, you will say, ah, who believes in that? I want to remind you that the Vitruvian man has been adopted by NASA as the emblem for their uh, exploration of outer space. And that image is the badge that is worn by all our astronauts um, in their interstellar trips. That image is sewed on the flag that is already flying on the moon. It has already gone beyond this planetary um, dimension and it is here to stay. So looking again, and what we mean by human when we say we humans are in this pandemic together. We humans are in this technological universe together. We 
may well be in this together, but we sure are not one and the same. So we need to think the, the interconnection of the different levels of our humanness, of our being human, but also the enormous differences that, that separate us. Um, uh, and I think um, those differences take the form of a critique of this civilizational model, um, this, this man of reason, uh, that is so standardized and yet this man of reason defines himself as much by what he excludes as by what it includes in his understanding of what it means to be human. And this he is of course put in inverted commas, but this is a masculinist ideals that excludes women, LBGT people, all kinds of others. And there is a process of othering built into the creation of this um, universal humanist ideal. And the sexualized and racialized others are those that fall out of the understanding of the human. They are human, yes, but of a second class, of a second degree. Now we'll come back to the critiques of humanism later on in some more details. But that is the first pole of the posthuman critique. We need to look at what it is that we say when we say we're in this together, we are all humans. Well, are we really? We may all be humans, uh, but some are sure more mortal than others. So how do we do, how do we deal with this necessity to find binding elements without flattening out the power differences between us? All of this is already complicated enough. Imagine when we come to the second pole of the, of the um, post-human convergence, the critique of anthropocentrism. What happens if we were to also made to acknowledge that all humans actually share a sense of exceptionalism and a speciesism as the environmental activists call it, and a sense that our species is really exceptional and special, that we have the right to exploit and access all other bodies of other species, and that we can treat nature as an endless supply of resources, accessible, usable, exploitable, and that we reduce the entire section of humans to the status of subhumans, and infrahumans, not quite humans. Anthropos is quite a, a regime of power. Now, environmentalists have been doing critiques of anthropocentrism for um, a long, long time, and they have taught us that there is an anthropocentric bias in everything that we do, even in critical theory, um, that there is always a, somewhere along the line about the suffering of humans, of humanoids. <laughs> uh, and it is much more difficult to think about the suffering of all other entities and at the moment of the planet as a whole. And the scale of the problems is what makes it very difficult to think the scale of the devastation of other species, the scale of the environmental um, devastation, the scale of the human losses uh, in terms of the COVID epidemic, the scale of the loss of animal lives in the bushfires in California and Australia, the scale makes thinking a very painful exercise. And I think thinking in a multi-scalar manner is one of the issues that is required of us at the moment. But thinking beyond our species is a little bit counterintuitive. It is not something that we are taught to do easily. Um, it doesn't come normal. It doesn't come as easily as to say, oh, I am against capitalism. Oh, I am against patriarchy. Oh, I am against heteronormativity. Oh, I am against uh, fossil fuel. Stand in front of the mirror and dare to say, I'm against the human species. Um, you may do it on a day uh, you're having a bad day or you're a bit down, but it's not part of the repertoire of critique. Um, uh, and it shouldn't be, because thinking beyond anthropocentrism is not thinking against the human, it's thinking a little bit beyond the parameters of our own egotism. Um, we should also keep in mind that this sense of species supremacy 
the idea that humans are somehow exceptional is part of the nature culture, mind body divide that is so crucial to Western thinking, to Western culture, Western philosophies. And most cultures on earth do not think in such dichotomous and oppositional ways. Indigenous epistemologies, decolonial thinking, black philosophies are teaching us a lot about the human animal continuum, the nature culture continuum, the interconnections among species and dimensions. It is something that my philosopher teachers would call holism dismissively, or even worse, horror, animism, to believe that everything that lives um, is actually logistically and ontologically alive. Um, we are not encouraged to think um, in terms of continuums like that. And yet the ecological devastation of today is a result um, of the uh, abuses of settler colonialism, of the looting of resources through European imperialisms. Um, we can think back to the role of epidemics in colonial conquest. South America would be an example, but Australia also. We can, can think of in terms of continuing forms of environmental racism. We could think along those lines, but we don't automatically do so. And I think one of the punchlines of the posthuman convergence is to encourage us to go and move in that directions. Um, another way to describe this convergence is in more sociological terms. We are caught between the fourth industrial revolution with its advanced technologies, genetics, informatics, neurosciences, nanotechnologies, and the sixth great extinction, also known as the Anthropocene, between two totally opposed um, uh, tendency. And it is not as if we have the fourth industrial revolution on Tuesday and the fifth great extinction on Wednesday afternoon. They are happening at the same time, concurrently. And the reason why I want to stress the convergence of the two is that I don't want them to fall apart. I want us to be able to do the impossible, which is to think conflicting ideas at the same time, make our mind work a little bit over time and think one thing and the opposite at the same time. And again, this is not what they teach you uh, at school. You're not, you're not encouraged to think in internally contradictory, slightly schizoid terms. We are encouraged to think in a linear sequ sequential manner. But ladies and gentlemen, look at the world that we're living in. <laughs> If I am to think um, in terms of the fourth industrial revolution and the sixth great extinction, if I, we are to think in terms of robots that take care of us um, and acidified um, plastic stifled oceans, if this is the world that we're living in, then we need to learn to think differently about the issues that we are um, confronting. And I think for me, it is the historical reality of the posthuman convergence that is forcing us to think differently. I don't think the posthuman is a science fiction figuration. I don't think it's a utopia to come, although some of the transhumanists would like that. I think it's an indicator of the scale and depth of the problems that we are confronting. And look at this, the floods, and the bushfire, again, the absolute scale of the devastation, the sorrow of that. Um, this is a world in deep mourning. Um, and so I would like to encourage us as a starter to think, to keep in mind the convergence effect and um, keep the complexity in mind. Do not just focus on the environment or just focus on how wonderful our technologies are. Let's try to find the overlapping uh, effects um, because if we do separate them, then we are losing out on the subtlety of the power analysis that we need in order to make sense of the reorganization of the human that is happening as a result of this massive convergence. So an example of excessive focus is the discourse around the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is almost a full scale industries of panic 
and a lot of the indigenous thinkers, black thinkers, uh, B. Rose, B. Vivero de Castro, uh, warn us that really there is a touch of white panic about the Anthropocene, <clears throat> the fear of the extinction of our culture. It used to be the Anthropocene, but it's become the Capitalocene, the Hutulocene, the Anthropocene, Plasticocene, Plantationocene, Misanthropocene, and the sequence continues. Um, um, and I think that there is this kind of tendency to fix one concept and then the concept goes in a loop and it takes off in all direction and it does not become a very useful navigational tool. I would prefer to use the convergence as a navigational tool and then within the large scale of the problems that we are zooming in on, decide where we put our efforts, where we focus our thinking, our planning, our resistance, our creativity in order to make a difference, but in an intertwined, integrated manner, not in a separated one. So complexity here and uh, flexibility, uh, feeling at home with the contradictions because they are the contradictions of the world that we are living in. And the world is for me, the point of reference, Thinking is the stuff of the world, as my friend Stacia Lemo wrote in a wonderful book on materialism. Thinking is everywhere. Thinking is our mode of relation to the world. Thinking means taking in and taking on the world. And taking in and taking on the world means taking in and on the pain of the world the sorrow, the problems of the world. There's an element of compassion needed, an element of stoicism, an element of stubbornness, saying no to many things, and an element of care, undeniably, to which I will return in the conclusion about the ethics of affirmation. So with this general cartography in mind, how are we to think? How do we go about finding a thinking methodology through this mess. What are the building blocks? And the first one, you already heard me say, it, but now I make it explicit. We need to start from the assumption that the human is not a neutral term. No point getting panicky about the posthuman as if the problem was new. The human was a can of worms to begin with, not a neutral term, but one that indexes access to specific powers, values, norms, privileges, entitlements, rights, and visibility. So critical questions about the limits of the human have been asked from the beginning of the dawn of, the, of, of human rights um, with the revolutions of the 18th century. Um, uh, universal human rights uh, but how universal are they and who counts as the human of those rights? Um, and I think built into the criticism of the non-neutrality of the human is the question of the status of difference. Um, what is the status of the sexualized, racialized and naturalized others that do not coincide with the Vitruvian ideal of that particular man of reason. Um, um, women, LBGT plus people, racialized indigenous people, the whole range of non-human others. Um, so dehumanize others, non-human others. What does it mean to be human uh, for, for those entities? And what kind of post-human visions are produced by people who are positioned as human in that perspective and not coinciding with a man of reason, but being the other sexualized, racialized, naturalized other of the man of reason. Um, what does it mean not to be recognized as human, but to be disqualified um, as subjects of knowledge, disqualified from citizenship, disqualified from symbolic and social presence. Um, and of course, a disqualification that in Western culture applies to all the non-humans, animal plants, etc. 18th century, two example, my favorite um, critiques of the human. And I want to give you this example because I don't want you to think that the only people that criticize universalism are those mad postmodernists from the 20th century. 
it is true that postmodernists in the 20th century criticized the universal, but criticisms of the universal predate all of this. Olympe de Gouges, uh, 1792, in the middle of the French Revolution, answers the writing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by asking a very simple question. Are women part of that universal understanding of human rights? Apparently not. Then Olympe de Gouges writes a Universal Declaration of Women's and Citizens' Rights. Um, and as you may know, she was thanked for her effort by being immediately dispatched to the guillotine. Zero time uh, to think about that one. Simple, so much for brotherhood. And it will be a couple of centuries before sisterhood comes into the picture. Again, in the middle of the French Revolution, Toussaint Louverture, Haiti, the Haiti Revolution, reads the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and says, okay, let's apply to the abolition of slavery. If we're all universal brothers, what are same, some in chains and enslaved? Um, and same thing with Toussaint Louverture, in no time the French Imperial Army comes in and is put out of his misery. Uh, so immediately um, the question of am I human too comes into the picture, a question that will be then uh, absolutely <clears throat> reiterated through time in the struggle for the emancipation of <clears throat> enslaved people, for the emancipation of women. I had to struggle very hard to find a Vitruvian female. Can you go to the next one? Thank you. Look at all I could find. I'm appealing for some better ones. Um, um, and am I human too has a long, long history. So do not make that coincide with any fluffy postmodernist deconstruction. It isn't. It's a robust critique that is built into the history of humanism and uh, and universalism. Uh, it is the strength of humanism as Edward Said taught us that you can critique humanism in the name of humanism. And it's one of the strengths and one of the reasons for its longevity. It's an incredible concept and incredible practice. So you can still stay within humanism and critique it in a way um, that makes, uh, in a sense, it makes it almost impossible to be an anti-humanist. But be that as it may, nowadays, this vision of the Vitruvian cyborg is the dominant vision. And I want to make an annotation about this because this vision of the, the Vitruvian cyborg as the next step of human evolution is very worrisome. It's actually very problematic. It is an image, an emblem, it is a theory and a practice also known as transhumanism. And transhumanism is the posthumanist theory that firmly believes that we need to enhance the current version of the humans through technology, implants, uh, neural implants, etc., enhance the current version of the human so that we can accelerate our neural and uh, thinking computational capacities in order to become as fast as the technological networks that we have ourselves created. Artificial intelligence is faster, more complex than human intelligence in computational terms. The transhumanists think that we need to enhance the humans in order to move on to the next phase of evolution. This is the ethos of Silicon Valley. It is the ethos of a number of schools. And my critical posthumanism, critical posthumanism in general, is very critical of this version and is saying just a moment. First of all, are you reducing the capacity for thinking to computation? Is thinking about computing, is that what it is? You, you heard me say at the beginning, thinking is like breathing. Thinking is relating to the world. You think with the whole body. You don't just think with a black box of algorithms. <laughs> That's computational thinking, a different type of thinking. So what do we do when we think emerges as a very serious issue? And secondly, if we're talking about human enhancement, who decides what gets enhanced by whom, when, and where? What is the selection principle? And when people talk about a soft eugenics, 
built into transhumanism. Um, I, for one, get the shivers. Um, I am not particularly happy um, with a future that looks uh, like the Vitruvian cyborg is the only model of the posthuman that we can become. The question is how many other models um, of posthuman becoming can we invent together? So, so how we do posthuman thinking becomes a political and an ethical issue. What kind of posthuman subjects do we want to become? Notice that my argument is not against technology. How could I be against technology and be speaking to you via Zoom across a, a massive pandemic and, uh, in a world structured like this? Let's not be delusional. Technology is here to stay. Technology is part of the problem. It has to become part of the solution. So how do we account for the, the fractures and the contradictions um, of the times? Um, and how do we become posthuman subjects worthy of the times? I am borrowing worthy of the times from Nietzsche, reread with my favorite philosopher, Gilles Deleuze. How do we raise to the occasion, not avoiding the issues, but really engaging with them without getting too depressed, without getting immediately nihilistic, Without giving up, let's try to have a go at what it could be like to think a possible path of becoming otherwise posthuman, knowing that so many of us start from position of being humans that do not coincide with the dominant subject um, position, the subject whose image is on the badge of the suits of our astronauts as they go into outer space. Some of us are planetary beings, some of us are terrestrians, and this is the planet that we intend to stay on and to inhabit. So important for the posthuman community is the cartographies, and the cartographies is a little bit what I'm doing here. You could say it's a discursive and material uh, report, account of the world that we are living in. It's looking at monuments and documents in order to map cognitively and morally and politically the forces at play in making the world that we inhabit. I was a student of Foucault and for me, knowledge and power, tracking the modalities of knowledge and power production is what critical thinking should be doing. Account for the world that we're living in fighting the post-truth and alternative truth, working together towards adequate understanding, an adequate understanding of the world that we're living in. Cartographies, maps are materially embedded but theoretically driven, <clears throat> politically informed, a reading of the production of knowledge and of knowing subjects in the contemporary world. In the making, of the cartographies as sort of critical probes. It's like probing and finding out in the making of these cartographies, the arts, all the art practices, as well as activist research, citizens and science and citizens organizations are of the greatest importance. We are living in a world where knowledge is produced everywhere where the old institutions that used to be the location of knowledge, academies, universities, are at times actually struggling to keep up with the immense production of knowledge going on everywhere, not only in the corporate world, but everywhere. There is a distributed political economy of knowledge production at the moment that makes all of our efforts at being creative, at being activists together, just as scientifically important as what goes on by the name of uh, dominant science, which Deleuze calls royal science, thinking of the royal uh, academies. Crucial to my understanding of the co contemporary power, the shifting uh, position of differences. Uh, I don't want to be too philosophical, it's late, we're running out of time, but we need to, to be de disengage differences from negativity. To be different does not mean only to be different from the dominant vision of the subject. It can simply be being different um, uh, as a value in itself. Um, and here there is the polemic about the overcoming of the dialectical model. 
that we don't need an antagonistic oppositional understanding of difference. We can go with Foucault and think of power as both negative, entrapping, calls it potestas, and power as a positive and in, in empowering potentia. And in philosophy, we call this the switch from Hegel to Spinoza. I know some of you out there are neo-Spinoza, so I throw this in for you, but I leave it there. Uh, but there is a shifting location of differences. Differences almost become verbs. We differ, differing. But it's not differing from a centralized model. It's differing in a multilateral relational way. It's the Spinozist understanding that we're all part of the same matter and we differ as modulations within the same matter. Crucial also, the understanding of time. When we're trying to think of the present, um, it, it really, we may be overcome by the weight of it, the burden of it. Um, but the present is not this static block um, that, that, that blocks all thinking because it's so full of problems. We should think of the present as a time continuum that is multi-directional. And when we think in terms of posthuman becoming, then the present is both the record <clears throat> of what we are ceasing to be what we no longer are, we are no longer the man of reason, I hope, the astronauts notwithstanding. The record of what we are ceasing to be, but it is also the seed of what we're in the process of becoming. The present looks in both direction and, and it is the processes here that are crucial. And for me, thinking is empowering cartographies that help us understand how we become otherwise in the present situation. You will have noticed that in a lot of what I say, I stress the question of subjectivity. And subjectivity is not a big issue in posthumanism. Most posthumanists, I'm thinking of Latour, Bruno Latour, for instance, do not want to talk about subjectivity, do not, and are particularly interested in subjectivity. Well, I am. I think we need to think ourselves as empirical, historical entity uh, inhabiting a particular historical moment and um, materially embedded and embodied, but in movement, in processes of becoming. Nomadic is the, the term that I use borrowed from Glissant and Deleuze, relating to both human and non-human, but complex, we are complex assemblies. Uh, to be a subject means to be partly animal, partly technological, partly environmental, partly social, it's a heterogeneous assemblage. It is not the hard boiled egg of Cartesian cogito ergo sum. It's not that model that we need today. It's an open model of a very relational subject plugging in in a multiplicity of sources. So posthuman subjects, if we can go to the next one, are complex, embodied, embedded, non-unitary, relational, affective, collaborative extremely important and um, to be open and relational means you are dependent on a multiplicity of others um, and multiplicity of others includes non-human others um, all kind of human others so going towards the conclusion then if we think of ourselves um, in this manner as posthuman subject and becoming starting from different ways of being human to begin with what we need now is not another rhetorical discourse about pan-humanity, another humanity bonded together in fear and vulnerability. And you will find this discourse of the apocalypse, fear and vulnerability in a great deal of literature, particularly about climate change. It is also, of course, uh, a, a, almost a refrain in right-wing discourses about the decline of the West and white supremacism. If we want to make planetary alliances that are both materially grounded and differential, we have to avoid pan-humanism and look in a much more careful manner at position, very grounded ways of becoming posthuman, not reactive, um, re composition of pan-humanity, but more grounded re-territorialization of what kind of posthuman we can become. It is the, the crucial message of our time is that we 
are in this con convergence, in this pandemic, in this conjuncture together, but we are not one and the same. We, I don't want to endorse an ontological kind of humanism that sacralizes the human. I want to activate multiple way of constructing communities across the board. What binds us together is the power of affirmation. The, the idea of an affirmative ethics that makes us worthy of our times, capable of inhabiting the posthuman convergence in order to make a difference, not only to resist, but to push it in the direction where we can all become our own variation of the posthuman, honoring our differences and making sure that not one model gets imposed upon us. Yes, we're in this together, but we differ. And those differences matter. They can make the difference between life and death. We need to honor the materially grounded, differential grounding of our being human and move on together. I firmly believe we can do this. And I see our exercise tonight as an exercise in constructing communities in this heterogeneous, exploded, but unified matter when the affirmative ethics is a praxis of constructing connections and sustaining them. Thank you. <laughs>